Morning, students. Welcome to another session. Hello, Victor. Hi, how are you doing? I'm fine, thank you. Did you have a good weekday? Yeah, I did. What about you? Mine was fine. I was just um I was it's just mostly work. And then I, I tried to do look at some of the assignments and try and see how I can do the essay. Okay. So do you have any question? Um, not at the moment. Most the most of my questions might come tomorrow when I'm actually when it comes to talking about the the assignment. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. So um the assignment discussion is um tomorrow. Tomorrow, yes. Yeah. So um were you able to check the um the recording for last week's Sunday? I, I was not, I was just so busy. Oh, okay. No worries. So you haven't like um, seen the record the recording yet? No, I was actually gonna look at the recording um, when I was free this next next week. Ah right, then no worries, no worries. Yeah. Um I right, no worries, no worries. So let's move on to, to today's learning outcome. So today we'll be looking at learning outcome nine, which is be able to understand and demonstrate team dynamics within an Agile team. We have this as, indica as indicative content. So we'll be looking at documents ladder for Agile teams, self-organization, cross-functionality, and Agile maturity. So <clears throat> the first thing we'll be looking at is um, what team dynamics in Agile is. So, um, over the over the past weekend, we've been talking about like agile, agile, and agile a lot. And obviously, like we've looked at several um frameworks of agile. So uh, another one we'll be looking at is team dynamics. So this plays a pivotal role in the success of agile methodologies. And frameworks such as Scrum, Kanban, and Extreme Programming relies on this collaboration and communication and adapt adaptability within the teams. So basically, it involves like collaboration with uh, using agile frameworks, and obviously effective communication and adaptive adaptive adaptability. <laughs> excuse me, the adaptability within the teams. So um, in this context, team dynamics refer to interactions, relationships, and overall synergy among team members as they work together to achieve common goals in an agile environment. If if you remember over the past few weeks, the the literally the things that we've been talking the most about is like being able to have effective communication, being able to like collaborate effectively with within your within any team you may yourself in in an agile in an agile environment. So this is literally what team dynamics talks about again. So what is the importance? Like in the previous slides, we noticed that collaboration, communication, adaptability, motivation, and engagement is, is a great, is a good importance. So the first one is collaboration. So this involves like collaborating with um with each team member over over individual efforts. Strong team dynamics foster foster on and foster an environment where members work together seamlessly. Leveraging each other's strengths and expertise to deliver high quality products or services. So um working together and, and obviously like um um just to like achieve a good goal, obviously like that 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 makes work seamless. And another one is communication. Obviously, we know that effective communication is essential in agile teams to ensure everyone is aligned with project goals understands their roles and responsibility and can provide timely feedback. So any any um, agile team you meet yourself, you might be able to like um, communicate effectively. So the communication should be open and transparent across every channel. This facilitates better problem solving and decision making process. The next one, adaptability. Agile methodologies prioritize adaptability to change. Teams with strong dynamics are more resilient and better equipped to respond to changing requirements. 
priority, priorities and market conditions. So obviously, like they can quickly adjust the approach and process to deliver value attractively and incrementally. So any environment you meet yourself, you must be able to like adapt to 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 change. You, you can't say that oh yeah because you are um you you know this you don't want to try something new out. You must be able to like adapt and try new things out. That's what that means. Motivation and engagement. Positive team dynamics contribute to higher levels of motivation and engagement among team members. When individuals feel valued, respected, and supported within the teams, they are more likely to be committed to achieving shared objectives and delivering quality outcomes. So we'll be looking at the definition of cross-functional and self-manageable agile teams. The first, the first one, which is cross-functional, so in agile teams, cross functional teams are composed of members with diverse skill sets and expertise necessary to deliver a company product or services. So instead of segregating tasks based on specialized roles, e.g., developers, testers, and designers, cross functional teams collaborate closely to tackle all aspects of projects from ideation to delivery. So in this in this part in this like um in this definition, so everybody comes to like everybody like comes together either either you're a developer you're a tester you're a designer like obviously like you don't talk about that everybody like collaborates closely and then they work on the problem so a developer can also be a tester and the tester can also be a, like designer so everybody comes together to like work on on that project this approach promotes shared ownership faster decision making and and a holistic understanding of the product requirements and challenges Self-manageable teams. Um, Self-manageable teams are empowered to manage decisions autonomously regarding how they will accomplish their goals. Agile principles encourage teams to be self-directed with members taking collective responsibility for planning, executing, and adapting their work process. Self-manageable teams are accountable for their outcomes and have the authority to adjust their strategies and prioritize based on feedback and change circumstance. So in this in this in, in this part, you are you are the owner of, of, of your work. So obviously like you're in charge and everything. And at the end of the day, any feedback you get, obviously like you must you you must add, you have to adapt to the um to the feedback that you are given and and every other changing circumstance. <clears throat> We'll be looking at we'll also be looking at overview of proximal ladder of for agile teams because this is one of our indicative content. So this is very, very important. So <clears throat> Toxman ladder, also known as Toxman stage, stages of group development, describes the typical phase that teams go, go through as they perform, I mean as they form, develop, and mature. So these stages are forming. Storming, norming, performing, and adjourning. So in the forming stage, which is literally the, the first stage, team members come together and get acquainted with each other. So obviously, like people um know each other. Um so if take for example, like a um a new company or like a new um an emerging company whereby they hire loads of people to like they recruit loads of people. Let loads of developers, loads, loads of um loads of testers and everything. So in this aspect, everybody gets to know each other and everybody interacts by by knowing um by knowing each other's roles, they set goals and they clarify expectation. So that's what the forming um is usually about. And then the storming, the storming is characterized by conflict, disagreement, and challenges. So every we all know that every team member and every most companies like they they have conflicts and they have disagreements. So that is what the storming phase is all about. Um, so this phase is crucial for resolving differences, establishing establishing norms, and building trust within the teams. And the norming during the norming stage, team members start to reconcile their differences, collaborate more effectively, and develop a sense of cohesion. So that is the phase whereby like you. People have like developed. You've grown into the company. You've grown with you've grown with each other. So the roles and responsibility are more clear, and trust and communication improve. That is what the norming 
stage stage is about. So the performing in the performance stage, the team reaches its peak productivity and effectiveness. Members can members work together harmoniously, leverage each other's strengths, and focus on achieving shared goals. Continuous improvement and, and innovation thrive in this stage. So literally in this stage, everybody like I've known like, you've all known each other. Um, you're working together. You're trying to like pick each other's brain, and obviously like you're cont you're cont you're continuously improving and and obviously like innovating. In that stage, a journey. This the journey stage occurs when the team completes its projects or disbands. Members may experience a mix of emotion as they reflect on their accomplishment and prepare to transition to new endeavors. It's essential to acknowledge and celebrate the team's achievement during this phase. So obviously, like if you guys decide that you want to work on a project, maybe you want to build a house and all after building the house, what's next? You celebrate that oh yeah, you've completed the house and everything. You might you might go for like you might go for for pint at the pub or like can't you can go they can just celebrate obviously like achieving a milestone and everything. So that's what the adjourning phase is for. Yeah. And then understanding cross-functional teams. First of all, we have to know what cross cross-functional teams means. So cross-functional teams are groups of individuals with diverse skills, expertise, and backgrounds who come together to work on a common goal or project. So literally, like, everybody have different background. So take, for example, you and I, um, Rufus and 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 hi right now we want to like make want to build something you have your you have your own area of expertise i have my own area of, of, of area of expertise but the point is that we bring that together just to like achieve a common goal maybe we want to build a mobile app that can control the weather maybe we don't want rain to fall tomorrow we want to build a mobile app that can control that so we have to like you have to bring your your knowledge. You have to bring your. I have to bring my knowledge, and then we'll bring it together and just achieve the common goal. So, unlike traditional teams, organized around specific functions or departments, cross-functional teams are structured to include members from different disciplines, such as development, design, marketing, and testing, and more. So, most most companies these days have this. Most companies these days have um, a development team, the software development team. They have this software, I mean, the design team. They have the marketing teams. Obviously, like the marketing team, they advertise and everything. They create um, SEO content, search engine content. And the testing team, they test the software that have been developed, that have, that have been developed by the developers and all. So most companies, most new companies have this. So the primary objective of cross-functional teams is to leverage the collective knowledge and adapt and, cap and capabilities of team members to deliver comprehensive solutions and drive innovation. Benefits of cross-functional teams in Agile. So the first benefit is holistic perspective. What does that mean? Cross-functional teams bring together a variety of perspectives and experiences, allowing for a more comprehensive understanding of the problem, problem space and potential solutions. This diversity foster creativity Excuse me. This diversity foster creativity and innovation, leading to more robust outcomes. So literally, like what what we've been talking about, like having different perspectives and having different experiences. So that is what the holistic perspective is for, and faster decision making. Obviously, like because of our because of our difference in in knowledge, difference in on in 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 experiences, we will be able to like think faster. I know, and we'll be able to like make decision faster instead of instead of just having a, a, a team filled with just people with the same experience. Obviously, it, it can be beneficial, but it's not as beneficial as, as having like loads of loads of varieties and everything. So faster decision making with all necessary skills and expertise represented within the team, decision making becomes more efficient. Cross-functional teams can address issues and make decisions in real time without delays associated with waiting for input or approvals from other departments. That's what that is about. Increased accountability. So every member is accountable for, for, for everything, whether the whether the team, whether the project succeeds or whether the project doesn't. So yeah, that's what that is about. In cross-functional cross teams, members share ownerships of the project's success. 
Each team member is responsible for contributing their expertise and ensuring that the team meets its objectives, leading to greater accountability and commitment to delivering high quality results. Flexibility and adaptability. Every cost functional team should be flexible. Or that means that obviously like, you should be able to like take on any task and you should be able to like, adapt to any task that you are given to. That's usually the summary of that. And yeah, so cross functional teams are well equipped to adapt to changing requirements, priorities, and market conditions. By having a diverse range of skills and perspectives within the team, they can quickly adjust their approach and pivot as needed to address emerging challenges or opportunities. The next one, improved, com improved communication and collaboration. In this part, obviously working closely together with people of different background, people of different experiences can improve the way you call the way you communicate and obviously like improve your collaboration because you can learn from a designer you can also learn from from a tester so working closely on a daily basis foster strong communication and collaboration among cross functional teams this open exchange of ideas like i said and information promotes knowledge sharing reduce silos and build trust among team members Characteristics of cross-functional teams. Give me a second. Oh. I, I thought it was the same. <laughs> Characteristics of cross-functional teams, diverse skill sets. So each member of diverse skill sets, each member have wide range of skills and expertise relevant to the project or goal they are working on. The skills may include technical, creative, creative, analytical, uh, and interpersonal capabilities. Shared goals and objectives. Despite, despite the diverse backgrounds, cross-functional team members are aligned around a common purpose and set objectives. They understand how their individual contribution contributes to the overall success of the team and organization. Collaborative environment. So every cross-functional cross -functional team strive in an environment that promotes collaboration, open communication, and mutual respect. Team members are encouraged to share feedback, to share ideas, seek feedback, and work to get together to solve problems. So that is what that collaborative environment is. And like I said, you should know that like in this, since, since we've been talking about this, Topic. We'll be talking about collaborating and we'll be talking about effective communication a lot. So, yeah, that's one thing to point out. Empowered de de decision making. Members of cross functional teams are empowered to make decisions within their areas of expertise. This autonomy fosters a sense of ownership and accountability, driving greater commitment to achieving shared goals. Iterative and incremental approach. Cross-functional teams often adopt iterative and incremental approaches to, to project delivery, such as agile methodologies. So obviously, like they like by breaking down work into smaller manageable chunks and regularly iterating on deliverable, teams can adapt to feedback and make course, cor course corrections more effectively. So obviously, like the cross-functional teams. You are like adapt like you have to like take the agile methodologies by breaking down teams. Obviously, like you can use the Kanban board by breaking the, the task into um backlog, progress, and done. And obviously, like move from one move from one side of the Kanban board to the other. I know. Yeah. Self-organization in agile teams. That's that's a, another indicative content. Yeah. So definition of self-organization. Self-organization in, in Niger teams refers to the ability of team members to autonomously and collaboratively determine. Give me a second. Oh yeah. Autonomously and collaboratively determine how they will achieve their, their goals and fulfill their responsibility. So that is that is obviously like that is for you as an individual, like an individual determining how you achieve the goals and fulfill responsibility rather than rely on top-down direct directives or micromanagement. Some organized teams are empowered to make decisions, plan their work, and adapt to changing circumstances independently. 
this approach promotes greater ownerships, accountability, and flexibility within the team. So in this, in what, what this literally means is that like you are responsible for everything and you are trusted to make a decision by yourself or not. Principles of self-organization. Like we looked at cross-functional teams. This we also need to look at principles of self-organization. So we have empowerment, collaboration, adaptability, continuous improvement, and shared accountability. So the first one, empowerment. So this means that like I mean, like self-organization begins with empowering team members to take ownership of their work and make decisions autonomously. So, so you are responsible for everything that you do. This empowerment includes providing individuals with authority, resources, and the support they need to fulfill their role effectively. Collaboration. Self-organization thrives in environments that foster collaboration and open communication among team members. By working together, sharing knowledge, and leveraging leveraging each other's strengths, teams can collectively solve problems and achieve their objectives more efficiently. I don't want to talk about the collaboration because we've been we've been saying this <laughs> since the beginning, so I think we should understand what that means already. Adaptability, obviously, like you should be able to like adapt in any environment that you meet yourself and and all, and obviously, like. Self-organized self -organized teams embrace change and are adaptable to evolving requirements, priorities, and market conditions. They are agile in their approach, able to adjust their plans and strategies quickly to in response to feedback and new information. Yeah, continuous improvement. You must be able to like improve yourself. You can't just rely on what you know. Your, 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 the knowledge that you have, you must be able to like build yourself on new knowledge, you must be able to like evolve yourself and all. So back in the days, nobody knows about AI, but now there's loads of AI going on. So you can't just stick around about like, you can't just like, just have your old knowledge. You have to like evolve and all. Like you have to be able to like use tools and new tools and everything. That was what continuous improvement is all about. And obviously like, how can you do that? Some organization encourages a cultural continuous improvement where teams regularly reflect on their process identify areas of for enhancement and implement changes attractively by seeking opportunities to optimize their workflow and practices teams can increase their efficiencies and effectiveness over time share that accountability in, in self-organized teams accountability is shared among all members each individual each individual is responsible for their contribution to the team's success and there's a collective commitment to achieving shared goals and delivering values to stakeholders do we have do you have any questions so far before i continue um no not at all I don't uh, then, yeah i'm just trying i'm just trying to follow if anything i'll rewatch what you've said because um i'm just trying to understand everything Okay. Is there okay. any videos after the lesson to try and give a more visual understanding? What did you say? Is there any videos that can give a visual understanding? Ah, that's my bad. I forgot to attach a video to this, but obviously, like, just remind me after the lectures to, to attach a video to it. I mean, like, just uh, remind me to just like show you, sh show you, a, show you a video because there should be loads of videos on YouTube. I forgot, I forgot to do that. Okay, yeah. apology. So obviously, like, um, let's fine. do this. Let's do this after the class. Let's just do this after the class. Yeah. So that we don't like um, waste time. Or oh, let me see.
Yeah, so we can watch this literally after. And uh, yeah. So we are here. I think I think we are here. Yes. Let me move this up because it's literally before any other thing. Uh where did we start talking about? Okay. Yeah. I need to bring it up here. Yes. Yeah. After the overview of documents, you can then watch the video. Or not. Yeah. So let's continue. Documents ladder for agile teams. We spoke about the principles. Yeah. So this is the overview of Tokman stages of group development. Tokman stages of the group, group development, also known as Tokman's ladder, describes, describes the typical phases that teams go through as they form, develop, and mature. Have we already spoken about this? Oh no, we haven't. We? Oh yeah, we have. Yeah, but yeah, but just to just just to recap, we know what the what forming stage is. We know what storming stage is. We know what norming stage is, and we know what performance stage is. Obviously, like the forming stage is everybody comes together and then they create a goal. They create a set of rules. I mean, they establish rules and they set goals and everything. And um, the goals are um explained. Obviously, like there's a clarity. Uh, they clarify the expectation. Team members may rely on guidance from a leader or facilitator to navigate this stage. The storming stage, um, obviously, like this is where always the there's conflicts, the disagreement and challenges and everything. So um, that's this stage. The storming stage is usually like it's literally for resolving the differences, establishing norms and building trust within the team. The normal, the normal stage, uh, I mean the normal phase or stage. Um, every team member knows their roles in this in this phase, and then your responsibility and and roles are more clear in that in this stage. And obviously, like there's trust and communication, there's there's trust and effective communication in this stage. In the performance stage, um, I don't I don't, I don't think we I, I'm not sure if we even spoke about this, but the performance stage. Uh, is when the team reaches its peak productivity and effectiveness. That's when, like, obviously, like team members like uh, focus on each other's strengths just to achieve shared goals, and then you you continuously improve and you innovate in that stage. So, in the performance stage, team reaches its peak productivity and effectiveness. Members who work harmoniously, leverage each other's strengths, and focus on achieving shared goals. Continuously, um, continuous improvement and innovation thrive in this stage as the team operates at its highest level of functioning. So how do we apply Stocksman's Ladder to Agile teams? I'm not sure if you can see this clearly. Let me make it a slideshow. Yeah. Agile teams can benefit from understanding and applying Stockman's stages of group development to their journey. Here's how each stage applies to agile teams along with associated challenges and opportunities. So the forming, what is the challenge in, in forming? Agile team may face challenges related to understanding their roles. Like they said, in that in that in the forming stage, you're trying to understand your role, you're trying to understand your responsibility. So that's the challenge in that in that phase. So agile teams may face challenges related to understanding their roles, establishing effective communication channels, and aligning, aligning on project goals and expectations. Team members may come from diverse backgrounds and have different levels of experience with agile methodologies. So what is the opportunity there? This stage presents an opportunity for agile teams to, to establish a strong foundation for collaboration and teamwork. Team members can leverage agile practices such as sprint planning, daily stand-ups, and retros retrospectives to facilitate introductions, clarify roles, and set initial goals. So take, for example, you usually just joined 
a company, maybe like Accenture and, and all this kind of stuff, or like a new a new company, and it's like you don't know what to do. You you probably don't know, like obviously you know you you know that obviously yeah yeah you're maybe a software developer or a software tester, but the first few weeks you probably literally don't know. So that is what this stage is about. It is the challenge is like you don't understand your role. There's no like communication. You don't know who to talk to. So as as an agile as an as an agile member or agile team, obviously like they facilitate um effective communication and obviously like such as daily stand ups and everything, and then they clarify the your goal and then they set the initial goal. That's what the opportunity of agile team. One of the one of the, <laughs> I mean one of the um agile team opportunity in that in that in that phase. And then Stormy, obviously the challenges in Stormy involves conflict whereby there's loads of disagreement, um, resistance to change and and uncertain about roles and responsibilities during this Stormy change. Lack of trust and communication barriers can impede progress and lead to frustration among team members. So what is the opportunity? What kind of opportunity or what is the opportunity of agile teams here? Give me a second. Let me make sure that this is this and this and different and oh yeah i think okay and then the last one which is performing yeah so this opportunity is for performing this of challenges for me opportunities for me challenges to me opportunities to me so what is the challenges in storming obviously We've, we've said that and opportunity stormy presents an opportunity for agile teams to address conflicts openly build trust and establish norms for communication and collaboration so in this part agile team they address the conflict so if there's a disagreement between you or someone else they address it openly and then they advise for open communication and then they, ad they advise for collaboration and everything. Of course, at the end of the day, in, in a team or in a company, everybody must, must be able to work with each other. Agile ceremonies such as sprint reviews and retrospective provide structured forums for addressing challenges, resolving conflicts, and aligning on team objectives. And then the next one, which is norming, what, what is the challenge? Agile teams may still experience challenges related to maintaining momentum, adapting to agile practices, and integrating new team members during the norming stage. There may be a need for ongoing refinements of process and workflows to optimize team process. So what is the opportunity? Norming allows agile teams to solidify their processes they find their working agreements and strengthen relationships among team members by embracing agile values such as openness, respect, and courage. Teams can foster a culture of continuous improvement and collaboration. And then the performance stage, um, obviously, like the, if you are working like the performance, you can experience um, what's it called burnout, and some people might be resistant to change. And there may be pressure to maintain high level of productivity while balancing workload and address, addressing potential bottlenecks. What is your opportunity? Performing, performing represents the culmination of the Agile team's journey, where they operate at peak efficiency and effectiveness by leveraging Agile principles such as customer collaboration, responding to change, and delivering value attractively teams can sustain their momentum and achieve their goals successfully. Our next topic is Agile Maturity Module. So what is Agile Maturity? maturity? What is Agile Maturity? It's usually one of our indicative content, which is the last indicative content. What is Agile Maturity? Agile Maturity refers to the level of proficiency, proficiency and effectiveness with which an organization or team applies agile principles and practices to its, to its work process. It reflects the organization's ability to embrace agile values 
adapt its culture and, and process accordingly, and continuously improve its agile practices over time. Agile maturity encompasses various aspects, including leadership commitment, team collaboration, process optimization, and customer focus. So levels of, we have levels of agile maturity. So what are the levels of agile maturity? Agile maturity models typically define multiple levels or stages of agile maturity that organizations can progress through as they adopt and integrate agile methodologies. While the specific terminology and criteria may vary across different models, common levels of agile maturity include initial or ad hoc. So in this level, organizations have just started exploring agile methodologies or may have limited experience with agile practices. Teams may be experimenting with agile approaches, but lack cons consistency or formalized process. Agile principles may not be deeply ingrained in the organization's culture, and there may be resistance to change. So this is usually like the first phase, whereby like you are like to introduce the agile agile system into the company. Is it that the company takes it, or they may be, they may find it difficult to like to adapt to to change, which is literally like resistance to change and everything. Repeatable, repeatable or defined. Organizations at this level have established foundational agile practices and processes. Teams follow defined agile frameworks like Scrum, Kanban, and adhere to established rules, ceremonies, and artifacts. Obviously, like you've you've established everything here, you've defined everybody's role, you've defined everybody's, um, you've told them the goals and and their responsibilities and everything. Agile practices are more consistent across teams, and there's growing awareness of agile principle and values throughout the organization. Matured or optimized at this level, agile practices well integrated. Everybody knows different agile methodology and how to like collaborate and team. So at this level, agile practices are well integrated into the organization culture and process. Teams demonstrate high proficiency in agile methodologies and continuously strive for improvement. Agile principles such as customer collaboration and responding, responding to change and delivering value are deeply embedded in the organization's DNA. There's a culture of innovation, experimentation, and continuous learning at this matured level. So what are the strategies for building self-manageable agile teams? Building self-manageable agile teams requires a combination of strategies aimed at fostering autonomy, empowerment, collaboration, and accountability among team members. Here are some key strategies for building self-manageable teams. Obviously, you have to define clear and ob clear goals and objectives establish norms and working um, agreements, encourage open communication and transparency, empower teams with decision-making authority, foster continuous learning and improvement. So the first one, which is define clear goals and, ob and objectives, obviously you have to make sure that every team member understand the purpose, goals and objectives. How do you do this? You have to clearly define it and you have to explain it and you have to like, and they have to like understand what everything is all about. So clearly defined goals provide direction and focus, empowering team members to make informed decisions aligned with the team's objectives. Because if we don't if we don't clearly define the goals, the, the team might go astray. They might not like do what you what you set out for them to do. They might literally just do the wrong stuff or do do another thing that they're not or maybe we just waste time and everything. Establish team norms and working agreements. So collaborative defined norms and working agreements that outline how the team will operate, communicate and or collaborate, include guidelines for decision making, conflict resolution, meeting structures and communication channels. How do you do this? You do this by, by stand-ups and uh, this foster a shared understanding of core expectation and promotes a culture of mutual respect and accountability. Encourage open communication and transparency. Create an environment where 
open communication and transparency are valued and encouraged. Foster a culture where team members feel comf comfortable sharing ideas, ideas, feedbacks, concerns, and information openly. Regularly com communicate updates, progress, and challenges to keep everyone informed and aligned. You can also do stand up in this in this part. Empower teams with decision making authority. Delegate decision making authority to the team whenever possible. Empower team members to make decisions autonomously within their areas of, of expertise and responsibility and responsibility. Provide guidance and support for avoid micromanaging or imposing top-down directives. That means don't force them to do anything. Foster continuous learning and improvement. Encourage a culture of continuous learning and improvement within the team. Provide opportunity for skill development, knowledge, knowledge sharing, and cross-training. Embrace agile practice such as retrospectives to reflect on team performance and inspire areas for improvements and implement adjective changes. So that brings end to learning outcome nine, which is be able to understand and demonstrate team dynamics within an agile team. Also, just to recap, these are the indicative contents. Toxman's ladder for agile teams, solve organization, cross-functionality, and agile maturity. So before we continue to the other learning outcome, which is learning outcome nine, think, just give me a second. Yeah, we're looking at learning outcome 10 in a second. I think we should just watch this video. The five stages of team development. The Tuckman team development model. So what are the stages of team development? Studies have shown that a group needs to evolve through certain steps to become an effective team. The most well-known and memorable theoretical model of this development process is the Tuckman model. Bruce Tuckman did research that demonstrated that every team goes through various stages. He first identified four stages, and then, upon further research, amended this to five stages of team development. These five stages of team development are forming, storming, norming, performing, and adjourning. A manager can do things to speed the process through these steps to the performing stage. It is especially important to get through the painful storming phase. You cannot completely short circuit the system to get straight to performance. There has to be some pain to get to the gain. So let's look at the stages in turn. Forming. This is the initial stage where people come together to form a team. At this point, people and a team are trying to understand two fundamental questions. Why am I here? And who are you? But in trying to answer these questions, people are likely to be tentative and polite as they gauge the dynamics of the group and assess the other members. At this early stage, it is important that the leader casts their vision for the team to define success and answer the first question. To help with the second question, the leader or manager can create ways for the team members to get to know each other and settle in quickly. Storming. Next, a team goes through the storming phase. People become more assertive as the honeymoon period of forming fades and they start to try and get things done. Individuals want to know exactly what needs to be done and how to go about it. Wrestles over roles, goals and approaches to work are common at this stage. To help bind the team together, a leader needs to clearly define the overall mission or task, communicate the plan and help to facilitate agreement on ways of working. Norming. Once through the storming phase, the team can settle down to a more normalised state. Here the primary concerns are those of management, the questions of who does what, when and where. As the plan starts to be put into practice, people find their place and the team starts to progress towards their goal. For the leader at this stage, it is good to think about any barriers that are stopping the team from reaching higher levels of performance. 
what adjustments to roles, tasks, plans and processes can be made to improve efficiency? How can the team be best encouraged and supported so that it continues to grow momentum towards success? Performing. The performing stage is when the team reaches a flow and the outputs of the group become exponentially larger than the inputs. To get to this point, there needs to be an interdependence within the team, a level of trust that allows people to stretch their limits or find new and creative ways of doing things. The leader needs to cultivate a supportive environment, one of personal development and psychological safety that allows people to grow and experiment. The danger for a leader at this stage is to become complacent. So a good boss should always help the team to reflect on three questions. What should we stop doing? What should we continue doing? And what should we start doing? In this way, the team can continue to learn and improve. If not, they can fall back into the norming or even into the storming phases. A journey. Sadly, all things come to an end. Projects end or team members move on. When the situation evolves, when the task or team changes, then they enter an adjourning phase. A leader can help the team acknowledge and work through this phase. This period of transition might include a celebration of a job well done. But as well as happiness, there may also be disappointment that things have come to an end or grieving for team members who have parted from the group. The leader can support individuals through this process as they enter the forming stage again, either with the same group for a different task or with another team completely. And so the cycle starts again. So that is a brief introduction to the Tuckman model of team development. Identifying the different stages of forming, storming, norming, performing and adjourning helps a manager to assess a team's progression. By spotting where a team is located within the cycle, the leader can work out what the team needs to help it progress through to the next level. And the model is not just for the boss. It also helps a team to appreciate its own internal dynamics. A team with a common understanding of their progression is better equipped to propel itself more quickly through the different stages, particularly the storming phase, as it gives a shared perspective on why things might be difficult. Once people realise this phase is normal, it becomes less personal and they can focus on solutions rather than frustrations. If you would like to find out more on this subject or about other leadership models and decision-making tools, then click on the link or head over to the website at www. Yeah. So, learning our content, which is the last learning outcome before the ass assessment session tomorrow. So what is learning outcome 10? Be able to understand and demonstrate scaling agile to build complex products with large teams. What are the indicative content? Scaling agile, Scaled Agile Framework, framework which is S-A-F-E. -E. So you'll be seeing this a lot in this session. So what it means is Scaled Agile Framework and Large Scale Scrum, which is L-E-S-S. -S. We, we also have Nexus and Scrum at scale. The first thing we'll be looking at is Scaling Agile. So what is Scaling Agile? Scaling Agile refers to the process of extending Agile principles, practices and frameworks beyond individual teams large, beyond individual teams to larger, more complex projects or organizations. So that is usually what it means like. So you just, you, you scale it, that means that you expand it and up. So more complex projects or organization. While agile methodologies such as Scrum and Kanban are, are highly effective at the team level, they may face challenges when applied to larger initiatives involving multiple teams, dependencies, and stakeholders. Scaling agile involves adapting agile principles and practices to address the unique needs and complexities of larger scale projects or organizations, enabling collaboration, 
alignment and delivery of value across multiple teams. So what this is saying in essence is that like you scale agile to be able to be, to to be able to be to be usable in large teams or organization or not. So you scale it. That means that you extend it. You like you expand it or not. So importance of scaling for com for complex products. Scaling agile is crucial for organ for organization tackling complex products or projects that involve multiple teams, interdependent components, and diverse stakeholders. Some key reasons why scaling agile is important for complex products includes one, alignment of efforts, faster time to market, improved collaboration and communication, risk mitigation, enhanced flexibility, and adaptability. What is alignment of effort? So obviously like scaling agile facilitates, facilitates alignment of effort across multiple teams, working on different aspects of a complex products or project. It enables teams to synchronize the activities, dependencies, and prioritize priorities to ensure cohesive and coherent delivery. Faster time to market, by adopting agile practices at scale, organizations can accelerate the delivery of value to customers by breaking down large initiatives, I mean, yeah, into smaller, more manageable increments. This allows for faster feedback, attrition and adaptation, leading to quicker time to market and increased responsiveness to customer needs. The next one, improve collaboration and communication. Scaling Agile fosters collaboration and communication among distributed teams, enabling teams to work together effectively towards common goal. It promotes transparency, knowledge sharing, and cross-functional collaboration. We've, we, we looked at cross-functional collaboration in our previous linear outcome, which are essential for success in complex environments. Risk mitigation. Agile scaling frameworks provide mechanism for identifying and managing risk associated with large scale projects. By breaking down work into smaller batches and conducting frequent inspections and, ad ad and adaptation, organizations can mitigate risk clearly and proactively address issues before they escalate. The last one, enhance flexibility and adaptability. Scaling Agile enables organizations to respond more effectively to changing requirements, market dynamics, and customer feedback. It provides the flexibility to adapt plans, priorities, and strategies in real time, allowing teams to stay aligned with involving business needs and priorities. So those are the importance of scaling agile for complex products. Overview of scaling agile frameworks. So there are several frameworks and approaches available for scaling agile, each offering guidance, principles, and practices. So an example of this popular scaling agile frameworks include the safe scaled agile framework. We have the less large scaled scrum, Nexus, and we have that, which is discipline, discipline agile delivery. Obviously, this is not in our indicated content, but I just decided to include it so that we have more understanding and, and uh, more knowledge of scaling agile framework. So what is SAFE? So this provides a comprehensive framework for scaling agile across the enterprise. It's over guidance on rules, ceremonies, artifacts, and best practices for coordinating agile development across multiple teams, business units, and portfolios. Over the less, this is an agile scaling framework that extends the principles and practices of Scrum to larger organizations. It focuses on simplifying organizational structure, reduced dependency, and fostering cross-functional collaboration to, uh, to achieve agile at scale. Nexus, this is a scaling framework specifically designed for organizations using Scrum. So this is for organizations that, that use Scrum. It provides guidance on scaling Scrum practices to address the challenges of integrating work from multiple Scrum teams into a single product. 
And DAD, which is the last one, is an agile framework that provides guidance on scaling agile delivery within complex and enterprise level environments. It offers a pragmatic approach to agile scaling, emphasizing flexibility, adaptability, and tailoring to meet the unique needs of each organization. We are the next topic is overview of safe. We we literally we usually just looked at the, def the definition, but we'll be looking at it more detailed in this in this um, slide. So what is scale what is scaled agile framework safe? This is a comprehensive framework for scaling agile principles. And if you remember, we looked at agile principles some few some few weeks ago, maybe the second week. I think yeah, I think so. Yeah, second week. Yeah. So agile principles and practices across large enterprises. Safe provides guidance on how to align agile teams, coordinate work, and deliver value at scale while maintaining flexibility, adaptability, and alignment within business objectives. So this the frameworks literally provide guidance and all. It offers a structured approach that helps organizations navigate complexities of large-scale agile transformation and achieve business agility. So what are the core values and principles of SAFE? SAFE is built on foundation and principles, and these include alignment, building quality, transparency, program execution, and lean thinking. What is alignment? So obviously, like it emphasizes the importance of aligning business strategies with execution at all levels of organization. So every team members must must align, and then it's not about the team alone. Objective must align, and priority and priorities must also align. This is to ensure that everyone is working towards common goals and the different value to the customer. So everything you're doing must align to common goals. You can't be you can't be doing what is different. From what the goal and objective that that was set out to be, you can't you can't do that. And all. so, what is built in built in quality? So, safe emphasizes the importance of build building quality quality into product and processes from the start. A popular company that does this is Apple. Everything Apple build is like there's always quality in it, even if there's little <laughs> to, uh, to no upgrade on their devices. But there's literally like quality and not. So I'm pretty sure that they use this, this principle. Safe emphasizes the importance of building quality into products and processes from the start. It encourages practices such as continuous integration, automated testing, and continuous deployment to ensure that high quality working software is delivered consistently. You can't you can't deter from that. You can't like do something else. You can't like go from being the best. The being from being you can't go from the, being the one that delivered the best to someone that delivers like rubbish and all. So you must build in quality into your product. Transparency, you must say promotes transparency and visibility into all aspects of the development process. It encourages open communication, shared understanding, and collaboration among teams, stakeholders, and customers to foster, to foster trust and accountability. Program execution. SAFE provides guidance on how to organize and manage agile release trends, which is art, which are cross-functional teams that deliver value in fixed time frame, typically eight to 12 weeks. Arts enable coordinated planning, execution, and delivery of large-scale solutions. The last one, which is lean, lean thinking. SAFE incorporates lean principles and practices to eliminate waste, optimize flow, and maximize value delivery. It encourages organizations to adopt lean practices such as value streaming, map, Kanban, and continuous improvement to efficiency and effectiveness. So the next topic is components of safe. Agile list train, our solution train, lean portfolio management. So safe consists several key components, which is the first one is agile release chain, which we looked at previously, solution chain, and lean portfolio management. 
What is agile really strength? Is it this is a team of agile teams, typically five to twelve teams that work together to deliver value in a predefined time frame, known as program increment (PI). Ads operate on a fixed cadence with synchronized planning, execution, and delivery to ensure alignment and coordination across teams. Second one, which is solution chain. The solution chain is is higher level construct that aligns multiple arts working on a common solution or product. So multiple agile release chain. So multi that's that's usually like multiple um, five to twelve teams and up. It provides a framework for coordinating the activities of multiple arts, managing dependency, and ensuring that the overall solution meets business objective and customer needs. The portfolio management, which is LPM, is a set of practices and principles and principles that help organizations align their portfolio strategy with agile development practices. LPM provides guidance on how to prioritize and govern investment, allocate resources, and measure outcomes to maximize business value and return on investments. So the next one, which is less. So we, we've, we've looked at scaling Agile, we've looked at scaled Agile framework, save, and the next one is less. So what is less? This is an Agile framework designed to extend the principles and practices of Scrum to larger organization and complex product development efforts. Less aims to simplify Agile scaling by focusing on the core principles of Scrum and minimizing additional complexity or overhead. It provides a lightweight framework that enables organizations to scale agile while maintaining transparency, flexibility, and alignment within customer needs. So what are the principles of less? We have empirical process control, customer centricity, whole team ownership, simplicity, continuous improvement. So what is empirical process? This involves a uh, core Scrum principle, which is it emphasizes on transparency, inspection, and adaptation. So team use feedback from regular inspections and adapt their processes and practices according to optimized outcomes. Customer centricity, we looked at that also um, last week. Yeah, we looked at customer centricity last week, which is in. Give me a second. Yeah, I think two weeks ago or so. Yeah, we did look at it. So, emphasizes the importance of delivering value to customer products. I mean, customers through too frequent and incremental delivery of working software. It encourages collaboration, feedback, and environment throughout the development process to ensure that the product meets customer needs and expectations. Old team ownerships. Let's promote the concept of all team partnerships, where all members of the team share responsibility for delivering value. So every team member are responsible for delivering value. Teams are cross-functional and self-organizing, with members collaborating closely to achieve common goals and address challenges collectively. Simplicity. Let's advocate for simplicity in both process and product development. Continuous improvements. Let's foster a culture of continuous improvement. So if it's like everybody learn and know, you must learn from your from your failures and you must learn to like to to be better and know. And obviously, like you must be able to adapt and know. So this is adapt your process attractively to achieve better outcomes over time. Structural elements of less. So what are the social elements of less? We have less huge, less rules, and less guides. So what is less huge? Less huge, sorry with the way this slides do. Oh, yeah, I don't know that matters. Anyways, so less huge is an extension of less designed for organizations with multiple teams, up to a few thousand members working on a single product or product or product line. Less huge provides additional guidance and practices for coordinating the activities of multiple teams while maintaining the core principles of less. Overall, less rules. 
it provides a set of guidance and principles for imp implementing less within the organization. So the the rules the the rules involve core practices, rules, ceremonies, and artifacts of less. What about less guides? So it provides resources, so it provides resources, case studies, and best practices for organization adopting less. The next one, which is Nexus. So we have Nexus. What is Nexus? Nexus framework is an agile scaling framework designed to help organizations scale scrum to large and complex products development efforts. So Nexus was developed by scrum.org. And take a look at scrum.org. My bad. Yeah. So the develop. So you can find more about Nexus in this link. Yeah. Nexus builds upon the core principles of Scrum and provides additional practices and guidelines for coordinating the work of multiple Scrum, Scrum teams. The framework emphasizes transparency, collaboration, and incremental delivery to enable organizations to scale agile effectively while maintaining alignment with business objectives and what? And customer needs. So also, what are the core Give me a second. Give me a second. Yeah, so. What are the core elements of Nexus? Um, we have Next Nexus Integration Team, Nexus Invent, Nexus Sprint Planning, Nexus Daily Scrum, Nexus Sprint Review, Nexus Sprint Retrospective. We uh, all this was almost all this was covered in the in the Scrum, um, in the Scrum topic, the top, the week that we discussed what like core element of Scrum. I think we also had something similar to it, but this is literally like it's Nexus and everything. So what is Nexus integration team? So Nexus integration team responsible for facilitate, facilitating coordination and integration among various Scrum teams within the Nexus. So um, you might be thinking that what is Nexus and all. So Nexus framework defines rules, events, and artifacts rules to ensure alignment, transparency, and collaboration across teams. We we'll literally like looked at that. Nexus events. So Nexus defines events or ceremonies that enables coordination, synchronization, and collaboration across teams. Nexus sprint planning. So Nexus Spring Planning is collaborative event where representatives from each Scrum team plan their work to be done during the upcoming sprints. Excuse me. I think, yeah, I need to take a glass of water. Yeah. Nexus Daily Scrum. So in this aspect, members of the Scrum teams come together to share progress, discuss the de dependencies, and identify any impediments that may affect the nexus. The, the emphasis is on transparency, communication, and collaboration to keep the nexus on track towards its goal. Nexus sprint review. In this aspect, all scrum, all scrum teams present the increment of their work to stakeholders and gather feedback. The focus is on demonstrating value, validating assumptions, and incorporating feedback to inform further sprint planning and product development. 
Next one, sprint retrospective. This is a collaborative reflection where a, where events where team where members of the scrum team reflects on their process and identify opportunities for improvements and commit to action items for the next sprint. So the last the last indicative content is scrum at scale. Scrum at scale is a framework designed to extend the principles and practices of Scrum to large-scale software development efforts. It enables organizations to scale agile practices effectively while maintaining transparency, flexibility, and alignment with business objectives. Scrum at scale was developed by Jeff Sutherland, one of the co-creators of Scrum, and provides a lightweight, adapt adaptable approach to scaling agile beyond simple teams. So let us yeah. I'll look at it here. I know. And also you can look at case studies and everything. These are case studies. Oh, this part of protected. Anyways, moving on. So what are the concept of core concept of Scrum Master Scale? We have Scrum Teams, Product Backlog, Scrum Master, Scale Daily Scrum, Scrum of Scrums. <laughs> this is very funny. <laughs> Scrum Teams, obviously, I, they retain the fundamental concept of Scrum Teams, which are cross-functional self-organization, I mean, self-organizing groups responsible for delivering increments of potential shippable products at the end of each sprint. So each team is composed of three to nine individuals. Product backlog. The product is a prioritized list of working of work items representing the requirements, features, and enhancements needs to, to deliver the product. So the product backlog is shared by all scrim teams working on the same product. The product owner is responsible for managing and prioritizing the product backlog. Scrum master. The Scrum Master serves as the servant leader for the Scrum team, facilitating Scrum events, coaching the team members, and removing impediments to, pro to, to progress. Also, Scrum Master may work with multiple teams. How do they do this? They provide guidance and support to help them adhere to the Scrum principles and practices. Scrum Daily Scrum. The Scrum Daily Scrum is a synchronization event where representatives from each Scrum team come together to discuss progress, dependency, dependencies, and potential impediments. Scrum of Scrums. This is a scaling practice in Scrum at scale that enables communication and coordination among multiple Scrum teams. It involves representatives from each team, meet, each team meeting regularly to discuss progress, share updates, and address cross-team dependency and impediments. Scaling practices in Scrum at scale. So the practices include scaling roles and responsibility, cross-team collaboration, prioritizing and backlog management, continuous integration and delivery, inspect and adapt. So obviously like Scrum at scale defines the clear roles and responsibility for scaling agile practices, including product owners, Scrum masters and Scrum teams. Cross-team collaboration. So um, Scrum, Scrum at Scale encourages effective collaboration and effective communication across all team. Practice such as, as the Scaled Daily Scrum and Scrum of Scrum facilitate coordination and synchronization among multiple teams. Prioritization and product management. So obviously like there needs to be priorities and then obviously like you have to like work on the, on the most important um, on the most important task first. And then, just to define it, Scrum as Scale provides guidance on prioritizing work in items and managing the product backlog effectively. It emphasizes on customer values, business priorities, and feedback in the in order of work. Continuous integration and delivery, CID. Scrum as Scale promotes continuous integration and delivery practices to enable frequent and in Incremental delivery of working software. Inspect and adapt. 
Scoma scale emphasizes the importance of regular inspection and adaptation to ensure that agile practices are working effectively and delivering values. So this brings an end, uh, or what we know as conclusion, to our class. I'm not sure if you, I'm not sure if you are still there, but if you are, um, yeah, yeah. The next tomorrow we'll be looking at the assignments. The assignments. Yeah, and uh, but obviously, like, I'm not sure. Have you been sent the ass assessment? The um assessment. Have you been sent the assessment? I don't think so. Oh, I don't. I was so. about to ask. Ask for it. Okay. Okay. Yeah. No worries. So, um, would would you be oh, present tomorrow? Just to know. I should be present tomorrow. Yes. Um, like I like, like I said. Is there anyone I can I can message to know the update of the of my web design assignment? Yeah. So, do you have the? Let me share my screen. I think you should have it. The email. The Lena, give me a second. Yes, I do. Yeah, so just send it. an email to this. Let, let me go. Is it? Um, what is, it? It, is it Lena work? I didn't, I, I didn't hear what you said. What, what did you say? Um, Lena work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I've sent it to the, to, 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 uh, to the chat so you can... Uh -huh. I've copied it now. Yeah. Okay then. 